Should we be surprised at the timing of an announcement of two new funds to this scale? Well, I'll say we're gratified by it. Uh, How so? I, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice vote of confidence right. uh, from our investors and some new investors who joined us. And, and I think it should be a boost, frankly, for the ecosystem. I think there is not, in my view, a retreat from technology investing. I think technology is moving very quickly. Uh, and I think what we found is that investors are still very interested. Uh, and this may be, in fact, a buying opportunity versus anything else. There's a wide remit. So it's all stages, early through growth, you know, software broadly, but, yeah. but you're, you're really more focused on the, the end markets. Um, what, what, what's the thesis behind that strategy? Sure. Well, the thesis is broadly B2B, so I'll start there. Okay. I think, you know, that's what we think we're best at. With Bank Capital, we manage $160 billion. We have ownership positions in hundreds of multi-billion dollar companies. And so what we bring to the table often is those first B2B customers, and that can range across commerce, financial services, application software, and infrastructure software. Um, and then in terms of stage, you know, we, we build our expertise in these domains, and that allows us to range widely in terms of from seed straight through to the later stages of venture. What's so fascinating, of course, is your own background, and in particular, you've got a background in fintech. I'm looking at some of the portfolios, and I'm thinking Go Cardless is definitely one that used to report on back in the UK. Yep. What was notable in your statement was how people have recently been questioning due diligence being done on certain companies and the ability to really help your portfolio companies. Is that a slight dig of what's been occurring largely in the world of crypto? I think of the FTX fallout. I know that you have exposure in previous funds to DCG. How are you thinking about really doing the diligence on companies in this new world, this new environment? I don't think there's anything new about the way we do due diligence now. I think, you know, Bain Capital has a, a, a long legacy, I would say, of being very careful, very analytical, and we didn't change anything about that. Um, I think this market environment is better for us. We can do more due diligence uh, in the way that we've always been accustomed to because we have more time to make deals, more time to get to know founders. What was disorienting about 2021 was frankly how quickly everyone had to move, and that mm. didn't play to our strengths. You know, we, we are known for taking our time and doing our work. Um, and so this market environment is frankly much more comfortable for us and our style of investing. And where will you be doing the investment in as well? I mean, are you looking at all geographies as well as all sizes of companies? We're, our team is split uh, between New York and San Francisco. Uh, probably 70% of our work in terms of investing is done in the US, and the balance is done in Europe. And that percentage has been increasing. We frankly, you know, I've been doing this 27 years. Uh, and, and a couple of decades ago, European venture capital was not that robust an area. And increasingly, though, in the UK, as you mentioned, with Go Cardless and around continental Europe, we're seeing really interesting opportunities with fantastic multi-time founders. So that's an increasing amount of our attention. Matt, I don't know. I'm looking for your reactions to whether you roll your eyes to this question, <laughs> but I'll just say artificial intelligence. I've heard about that. <laughs> um, uh, what is your view on artificial intelligence right now, and, and, and where do you see the opportunities? I mean, it's been a big part of our investing for the last 10 years. That, that's the thing. I think generative artificial intelligence yes, is should be brand more specific. new. Yeah. But I, I think that's relevant because we have deep expertise in that. You know, Semantic Machines was, a, uh, we think, the leading linguistic artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence company that we were the largest investor in, sold to Microsoft. And we've gone on to invest in the modern data stack, you know, to this day, most recently, a company called Unstructured, a company called High Touch. So uh, to us, generative AI is, is the latest in a series of advancements in modern data analytics and strikingly useful. You know, we already see it in use in our verticals, in financial services, very much in commerce and in marketing and sales technology. So we're excited. Caroline touched on it earlier, but you know, the, the firm uh, you know, last April launched a crypto-only fund. And I, and I wondered what your assessment is around the hype with generative AI versus what we saw in crypto-related companies in 2021 through 2022. Are they analogous or are these two separate things entirely? Well, you know, human beings are prone to boom and bust cycles in their yeah. excitement. <laughs> uh, and, and we saw that in, in crypto. Uh, in fact, you know, we've seen it three or four times in the last decade in crypto. Things get overheated, things break, uh, and so far they've always come back. Um, and frankly, AI itself, which is a term that's been around for 30 years, has seen its own boom and bust cycles along the way. I have no doubt things will get overheated 
in AI, and there will be articles in nine months about uh, uh, the letdown and, and yes. the un unfilled promise. Um, but we think the promise is quite durable as it relates to AI, and we also think that way about decentralization. And we're sticking to our guns on both those things for the long term. So looking for new opportunities in both those spaces, Matt? For sure. No, I mean, we tend to go where the most passionate and talented founders are. That's really the leading lights for us in terms of where we devote our energies. Um, and there have been a lot of sort of fly-by-night crypto founders who have left the field, and that's perfectly fine. But the founders that are dedicated to the ideas of decentralization, of leveraging blockchain technology to disrupt industries, they haven't left. Um, and there will be some fly-by-night founders in AI as well, and we'll ignore those uh, to focus on the really committed folks. Um, so yeah, we're very active in both sectors. We were just hearing from one fintech founder who I was lucky enough to speak with last week from Asusu, talking about, well, the oversight of regulation here in the United States as well. What are you making? What are the really infused, talented founders at the moment that you're speaking to making of the enforcement in crypto, the focus on fintech, the evolution of regulation here in the United States? Well, I think one way to look at it is actually it was quite striking the absence of regulation. Uh, for a long period of time. And almost always, in my experience, that leads to a backlash. The pendulum swings, and it often swings violently. Um, but these things tend to synthesize over time. We will end up, inevitably, with sensible regulation. Uh, that has been the pattern. And this is the awkward adolescence. Um, and we're going to see a number of fintech companies outside of crypto who also feel overregulated. I've, I've never met a founder who didn't feel overregulated. <laughs> Um, but I maintain the faith, again, having seen many of these cycles, that where we end up will be a friendly place for commerce, a friendly place for capitalism, and a place where founders can get over these obstacles and prevail. So we're very confident, actually. Matt, uh, Caroline and I expect to be talking about venture capital more than ever on this program. And, and as an asset class, for want of a better descriptor, I want to get into who, your LPs. You know, we talked so much about public market volatility last year, about the Fed. But I wonder who's coming to you and saying, I want to be involved in this project that across the $1.9 billion that you've, you've just closed. Well, I will say, as an asset class, uh, there were a lot of kind of tourists Tourists. Who, who came to the asset class in 2020 and 2021 with a great amount of enthusiasm to invest in exciting technology. And what we saw in 22, as the volumes of venture capital dropped dramatically, was it was mo mostly the tourists leaving. Um, and RLPs are not the tourists. RLPs are endowments and foundations who've been with us for a long time and who know us deeply and know us to be committed players. They themselves are committed players. So I think that's what you're going to see in 2023 is uh, a return to folks who are the stalwarts right. of this industry, both on the LP side and the GP side.